Hello, welcome to the Olea Medical Academy, a series of educational webinars hosted by Olea Medical. My name is Adam Davis, and I am the Chief Medical Officer at Olea Medical. Today, it is our pleasure to welcome Dr. Roland Beast, who will be speaking on clinical applications of ultra-high field MRI. Dr. Beast is the Deputy Director of the University Institute of Diagnostic and Interventional Neuroradiology at the University Hospital Bern, Switzerland a tenured university professor for advanced neuroimaging on the medical faculty at the University of Bern. He is the research director for the Advanced Neuroimaging Support Center and the co-director for education at the Center for Artificial Intelligence. Dr. Wiest is also the division head for ultra high field MR neuroimaging at the Swiss Center for Entrepreneurship and Translational Medicine. Training in neurophysiology, neurology, psychiatry, radiology, and neuroradiology, Dr. Wiest's clinical and research interests span two decades, and they have centered on the most dynamic and productive areas of neurologic imaging applications. This includes work on anatomic, physiologic, functional, and psychiatric brain mapping. To illustrate how prolific a researcher uh, Dr. Wiest is, I found 23 articles on neuroimaging and schizophrenia alone that he has authored. Other areas of concentration have included brain ischemia and collateral circulation, brain tumor, infection, metabolic diseases, and over the past decade, the imaging investigation of epilepsy. More recently, he has utilized deep learning methods within his research, notably to investigate brain morphology and remodeling. Dr. Wiest has also applied his expertise to the utilization of ultra-high field MRI, where he is a recognized world authority on the subject. Today, he will be speaking on the clinical applications of ultra-high field MRI, and we are very pleased and very excited to hear his thoughts on this rapidly evolving modality. Dr. Wiest? Thank you very much, Dr. Davis, for this kind introduction, and please allow me first to share my screen and with a short question if you can see the screen i would then start so everything okay everything is fine that's great so please uh, allow me first to elaborate a bit on our situation here in switzerland so we have at the moment two clinical imaging centers for ultra high field one in zurich the other one here in Bern. Bern is focused more on neurological and neurosurgical questions. And what you can see here on the left side, that is the new building that hosts uh, the ultra high field unit in Bern. So these are my disclosures. And these were the primary motivations that, that drove us into installing the system. So we got the 19th system in the world. We were really excited because we thought it could be something like, maybe you've heard about that, the European Extremely Large Telescope uh, in, in Chile, which is currently the largest eye into space. And so, of course, we were very excited if we would now have the largest clinical eye into the brain. And this is what the talk will be about. It will be about clinical questions and how ultra high field may help to improve the workup of patients, especially neurological patients, by providing better imaging. So I think the four key pillars, the four key advantages uh, of clinical ultra high field MR is the advantage of having better metabolic imaging. So there are options for different technologies dedicated to functional imaging. Of course, there's the option of higher spatial resolution. And all of that should translate into better and advanced patient care. And this all comes along with the advantage of an almost linear increase in the signal to noise ratio when applying ultra high field imaging. I think the new technical and, and, and the new clinical cleared devices, they have the advantage of being easier integrated into the environments because their weight has decreased. One of the particular strengths is uh, the, the higher isovoxel resolution, so to detect smaller lesions. There is, of course, the advantage of smaller voxel sizes for metabolic brain imaging, and you have different advantages in multinuclei, but also in bold fMRI. And some years ago, we had the opportunity to be part of a group that uh, provided the study that uh, led to the clearance of the first ultra-high field imaging device 
uh, at the FDA and the CE certification. And at that time, uh, we just simply looked at the advantages, at the potential indications that could solve clinical problems with ultra-high-field MR. And this was done among measuring also uh, the signal directly uh, with a with kind of a diagnostic confidence score. I would not like to go into details over here, but the higher the numbers are, the higher the confidence of the readers was that uh, the system, either with three Tesla or with seven Tesla, added advantage and confidence to the diagnosis. And you can see here for the four major uh, questions and the four major clinical challenges for getting better depiction of vascular disorders, microvascular lesions, microbleeds, for lesions in multiple sclerosis, cortical lesions, the presence of a central vein, and we will go into that a bit later, and also the iron deposits, but also into the detection of, of hippocampal sclerosis and brain tumor. The ultra high field systems showed a lot of increase in this diagnostic confidence in order to get the radiologist the better uh, confidence on making his diagnosis. I would like to go through four major um, challenges. The first one is the investigation of metabolic pathway abnormalities. And here, I think one of the definite advantages is the application of echoplanar spectral imaging. Here you can see one of the protocols for one of our sequences that has been developed in our department that uses these adiabatic pulses. So both they have an amplitude and a frequency modulation and they are very robust with respect to inhomogeneities in the B1 field. They are, they are frequency selective and their advantages are that they have a, a, a low SAR and that they allow also, and this is very important, to additionally suppress water and lipids. So our sequence uh, is based on two experiments. So there's first a non-adiabatic 90-degree pulse that excites the complete sp spin system. And this is then followed by two adiabatic P pulses. And, and during the first experiment, the complete spectrum is refocused. And then during the second experiment, only parts of the spectrums are refocused. And so uh, the subtraction of the different responses yields at the end the edited spectrum. And <clears throat> something that you can see here on the left, if you narrow down uh, the bandwidth, then you can eliminate the signal uh, from the water, but also from the fat tissue. And this ends up in a better signal for the edited um, spectroscopic markers. So you can see that on the right here, so GABA, which is at 3.05 ppm. You see a glutamate at 3.75, and you see also 2 hydroxyglutarate at 4.05, the latter being a very important marker also for the genetic classification of gliomas. So first I would briefly touch uh, the advantage of having GABA spectra within uh, the repertoire of the clinical MR. Here in the middle of this image, you can see the GABA map and the glutamate map in a patient with a brain tumor. And you can easily see that uh, these areas where the brain tumor is, they show a decrease in the GABA. In other indications, for example, like in patients with focal cortical dysplasia and epilepsy, GABA is similarly important because there you can measure also the increase of the GABA levels at the borders of um, <clears throat> the lesions. So I think uh, having GABA in is not only important for disorders that are related to psychiatric conditions, also very important to look for patients with epilepsy and for patients with brain tumors. Looking at patients with psychiatric disorders, it turns out that these reductions in GABA, they're very prominent in areas of the, of the forebrain, but also the parietal and um, the, the, the occipital lobe. And this is similarly seen in patients with uh, depressive disorder and schizophrenia. But in patients with schizophrenia, there's also a prominent GABA reduction in the temporal lobe. So these tools, they may help to monitor disorders like depressive disorders and also to monitor the therapy of these disorders in future. I would then briefly touch the method of chemical exchange saturation transfer. This is a non-invasive method that uh, provides information about metabolites and proteins uh, that 
have protons that exchange with the water pool and a meat proton transfer. And this is particularly work also of Olea. So, so the APT weighted imaging is an emerging technology, a molecular technology that generates image contrast from that is different from conventional MR. Its signal is primarily based on the concentration of endogenous proteins and peptides that are typically present in brain tumor tissue. That's something that you can see over here. You know, these APT emits, they peak at 3.5 ppm. That's not shown here, but amine uh, peak at a different uh, spectral point, so at 2.75 ppm. And uh, the group from Olia and also uh, our colleague, Dr. Casagrande, together with colleagues from London, Dr. Massini, they've recently shown that the IDH wild type, okay, I must have a higher amide amine ratio compared, for example, to oligodendrogliomas, but also uh, to the IDH mutant one. So, so this is a, a good marker not only to separate different genetic profiles um, of a glioma, but also to see which of this tumor have a higher risk of progression. And this can be, and this is the, 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 the nice combination, this can be nicely combinated with, for example, MR spectroscopy. And with MR sp uh, spectroscopy, we can monitor uh, mutations in the citrate cycle. So for, for an intact IDH mutation, uh, alpha uh, ketoglutarate will uh, be present during the, the utilization of uh, glucose, while in the mutated one, so in the, in the IDH mutated tumors, 2-hydroxyglutarate will emerge as a final peak. And this here indicates then the mutated tumors. And you can nicely now differentiate with this technology between uh, diffuse astrocytomas uh, with an IDH wild team that do not express this hydroxyglutarate peak. You can see this on the left here. And on comparison in the right, you can see a diffuse astrocytoma that is IDH mutated and this shows this 2-hydroxyglutarate peak over here. And these uh, changes, so this expression of the 2-hydroxyglutarate peak, they also nicely match with the so-called flare T2 mismatch, which is also a good indicator with a very high sensitivity for IDH mutated astrocytomas. And you can, of course, and these are images now that have been generated with the new ultra high field unit. Uh, you can also uh, combine these methods in order to get a better expression about the dignity and the genetic profile of such a tumor. On the left, you can see a diffuse astrocytoma with uh, decreased perfusion, so a, a decreased uh, cerebral blood volume. And you can see that this patient here expresses this 4.05, uh, the 2-hydroxyglutarate in the, in the spectroscopy, but you can also see that there is a low level of APT concentration. So the, all these findings, they indicate that this is a diffuse astrocytoma uh, WHO grade 2 that is mutated. On the other hand, and to contrast this, here you can see a more aggressive one. This is a very early uh, tumor, a very early uh, high-grade glioma formation. You can see the hyperperfusion over here. You can see the increase in the APT concentration here in the cest, and you can also see that there is no 2-hydroxyglutarate peak over here. So all uh, the different fingerprints, they indicate that this is a potential high-risk tumor over here. In the second part of the talk, I would briefly touch the opportunity of investigating brain function. And there we have, again, different opportunities. So we can perform the classical bold fMRI, so, so using uh, the concentrations of oxy and desoxyhemoglobin in the brain related to task or related to resting states. And we have also the option to measure the cerebral blood flow. And we currently use a sequence that we get from the University of Southern California, from Danny Wong. It's a, it's a puzzle sequence called WORST. And, and the advantage of this sequence is that you have um, <clears throat> an increased intrinsic signal-to-noise ratio, as it always comes with the high field. Uh, you have a higher labeling efficiency, and you have, by that, a perfusion signal that can be increased by 40%. 
And here you can see the, the practical use of this kind of images. So on the, on the left, you can see a patient with a calcified uh, lesion in the left hippocampus who is suffering uh, from, from uh, temporal lobe epilepsy. And you can see here over the activation map that there's still memory function is preserved on the left hippocampus. So this should then make you very careful in selecting these patients for a hippocampal selection. On the right hand, you can see a more high resolution imaging for finger tapping in a healthy control this time. And you can see beautifully how um, the, the activation is here along with the, with the salsi uh, of the motor cortex. So both advantages in the clinical, but also in the research domain allow you to better and to locally more precise evaluate the activation maps that are related to functional MRI tasks. Another uh, potential, this is still data from, uh, from a seed Tesla study in children, that is uh, the follow-up of stroke recovery. So we know that uh, during the early phases of stroke recovery, uh, when the brain starts to, to reorganize and to rewire the areas that are closely, um, those are closely related to the lesion, uh, there is something that is called interhemispheric imbalance. That means that the contralateral hemisphere will start to take over part of the function of the hyperperfusion in this contralateral area will be also increased. And in this pediatric study, we could recently show that this interhemispheric imbalance is rather low in patients that showed no hemiparesis in children, whereas uh, the children uh, that showed an ongoing hemiparesis had a high level of imbalance. And looking at adults, we could also show that the, the, the prediction of recovery is highly influenced by the level of uh, this uh, hemispheric imbalance in early stages. You can see this is the comparison between the healthy controls and the patients with spontaneous recovery. Uh, these data were taken out of a motor network that encompassed all the brain areas that are involved into the processing of tactile function. And something that you can see over here is that uh, in those patients that showed at the very beginning a low interhemispheric imbalance, uh, they also had a better recovery, while patients that showed already at the very beginning an extremely or a very strong interhemispheric imbalance had more problems to recover and at the end showed an impaired recovery. So this kind of non-invasive imaging tools that can be used in order to predict the potential of patients to recover. Another <clears throat> potential opportunity of having non-invasive perfusion imaging is looking at periictal changes. So these periictal changes, they inform you about the symptomatogenic zone, and it's, it's not a tool that can be directly used in order to determine the seizure onset zone, but it tells you if the patient, for example, is still in um, <clears throat> in a non-convulsive or in a subtle status epilepticus. And this also has been shown by different studies that um, showed an increased yield of the diagnostic significance for the ASL also compared to classical perfusion studies. And I just have here two examples. So this is a patient in a post condition that shows nicely on the left side this kind of, of hypoperfusion that indicates that he's in a in a post state, and this was also a young person <clears throat> that came to our hospital, and he said, uh, well, uh, I'm hearing ringing bells. And then the emergency doctor said, well, uh, we think you should see a psychiatrist. But the psychiatrist was very alert, and he sent the patient directly to imaging. And what you can see over here, that is a left-sided hyperperfusion. And this left-sided hyperperfusion was related to auditory hallucination because it was in the primary auditory cortex. And this was a patient with a newly diagnosed Mellas syndrome. And here there's a first symptom. He had a non-convulsive status that came along with the clinical presentation of hearing church bells ringing. So sometimes it can be really very informative. There is still more potential for this kind of technologies. It has been recently shown that you can also use the post perfusion changes of patients who are, uh, who are hospitalized during the workup of pre-surgical epilepsy during the phase one. So this is the non-invasive part of the epilepsy workup. 
And similarly to classical applications of, of nuclear medicine methods, also to SPECT, for example, where you apply a tracer, at the moment where the patient has the seizure, you do the same procedure then in an interictual period. You subtract uh, both of them, provide a set score map, and then look at this kind of different images. It has been shown also by a group from London recently that you can use this kind of uh, post ictal versus inter ictal uh, perfusion subtraction in order to determine the seizure runs and so on. And they have shown in their study that the diagnostic yield of, of taking into account this kind of subtraction perfusion changes is similar to the diagnostic yield of the surface EEG, but also of the nuclear medicine methods PET and SPECT. So we will look forward how we can implement this method in our hospital. We're currently building the setup to do so. And we're very excited to see if this also works with the ultra high field unit that we have. And in parallel, we have started to integrate also the combination uh, between BOLD, fMRI and uh, and EEG signals. And this is, I think on one hand, it's kind of a challenging method because you need to, to filter the signal of the EEG while applying uh, the bold signal, but it comes at a, at a very promising, um, uh, at a very promising diagnostic yield because you would be able to directly measure the hemodynamic changes within <clears throat> the so-called irritative zone. So the irritative zone is the brain area that generates the spike on the surface. And with the bold contrast and, and with the corresponding signal, you will get an idea about where these spikes are generated. And this again also will help uh, to determine the seizure onset zone. And this is extremely important, especially in patients with non lesional epilepsies, to determine uh, the area where the electrodes for the phase two, uh, for, the, for the invasive uh, part of the diagnostic workup of epilepsy, shall be. Implanted. So, in summary, there's a lot of, of different, I think, very exciting um, applications also for functional MRI, starting with classic, classical task based bold fMRI, and then going over via ASL uh, to combinations of neurophysiology signals and fMRI. In the <clears throat> third part, I would like to cover a bit more the classical applications. And as I said previously, so, so the, the principal advantage um, of the ultra high field MR is the higher spatial resolution and the possibility to build smaller isovoxel resolution sequences. And, and there I would like to start again with a clinical example over here. Then we have a young patient uh, that was at that time, I think he was roughly 11 years old, and he was suffering from a, from a very rare disorder that is called adipsic hypernatremia. So this is a disorder where the patients, they, they have an increase of, 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 of this uh, sodium in the blood and they do not feel it. So they don't have any thirst. And so this can be very threatening for the patient. And this disease appears to be related to autoantibodies against osmo receptors, and they either come along with tumors or with autoimmunity reactions, or with, with autoimmune reactions against these receptors. And this patient has received several three Tesla MRs, and they were always uh, considered as normal. You can see this here on the left side, that's the T2 weighted image, and you will see <clears throat> even retrospectively, it's very hard to determine if something is wrong here in this area of the hypothalamus. And here you can see the T1 and the T2 weighted image that has been generated by the ultra high field MR. And you can see there is a small lesion here on the left side on the hypothalamus. So the patient had a, had a lesion in the area that was regulating the thirst. And assuming that this was an autoimmune reaction, the patient was treated with plasmapheresis and he got the follow-up. And you can see after the follow-up and after the patient uh, improved, you can see that this lesion dramatically shrinked. So, so it is in some cases really helpful, especially in rare disorders or in small lesions like in the, in the brainstem or the hypothalamus uh, to help with the detection of, of subtle lesions that may cause uh, certain disorders that you will not expect previously. With that, I would like 
to come to our first experience with advanced patient care. And advanced patient care means that we have built in the alpha high field MR into the workup of the clinical patient. So this is not a primarily workup of the patient, so they will have undergone a three Tesla MR before, but if there is no solution and if there is no answer, uh, no clinical answer or no imaging answer to the clinical questions, then these patients will get additionally um, <clears throat> an imaging workup with the ultra high field unit. And there I would like to start with one of the, I think, most prominent use cases, that's the detection of previously unseen epileptic structural lesions. And recently, um, there has been a study issued that investigated systematically 16 different studies that investigated patients with negative MR, either at 1.5 or 3 Tesla, and they reported a huge variance within the studies, but they ended up in a pooled sensitivity of 31%. And the majority of the patients where new lesions were detected were patients with focal cortical dysplasia. There were patients that had a hippocampal sclerosis or where the, where the neuroradiologist was not sure if it is one or not, or a new seen gliotic scar formation. And the important point over there is that these, uh, this pooled and this systematic review also showed that most of the patients that have been detected also had a favorable outcome in epilepsy surgery. And this is something that we could reproduce in our data set. So we ended up with the same uh, uh, diagnostic yield than in this, in this, in this pooled analysis. Uh, we identified newly uh, patients with malformations of cortical development and proliferation in 12 cases. We saw one new patient with a migrational disorder. Uh, we also turned one patient back from being suspected of having a malformation of cortical development, a cortical dysplasia, into normal. And we had confirmatory scans of previously suspected lesions in roughly one third, while the other third of the patient after ultra high fields uh, MR still remained negative. I would <clears throat> again start with uh, this earlier study from 2016, where we had a closer look on patients with temporal lobe epilepsy. And it has been shown this, especially the, the, the detection of subfield lesions within the hippocampus. And the subfield lesions, uh, they may impact on the diagnosis. So a patient with a CF4 lesion has, for example, a different outcome, a different prognosis than a patient with a CA1 to CA4, or a patient that has an isolated lesion in CA2, which is still a worse prognosis. So. We were interested once, so, so could we determine <clears throat> these lesions and do they really help in looking at the substructures? And what you can simply see here is, for example, on the left, this is the patient with the suspected hippocampal sclerosis, but maybe you are not sure from the three Tesla images that there is a disintegration here, especially of the CR4 unit, but also here at the CR1 unit. And this has been confirmed by <clears throat> the ultra high field MR, by the coronary T2 weighted images over here, but also by the reconstruction. You can see that the shape of the left hippocampus is completely different from the shape of the right hippocampus, especially in the hippocampal body over here. So this kind of reconstruction and building then um, re 3D reconstructions of the hippocampus may really help in <clears throat> the determination of a hippocampal lesion. But I think the, the more challenging cases that we, that we have to face are the ones where the semiology of the patient, it means that the way the seizures clinically present and the imaging data are not really fitting. And I would also come with some of these examples. So the first patient here is a patient with a left-sided temporal occipital onset of the seizure. You can see here from these maps, from this T1 and flare weighted maps, um, <clears throat> that the potential cortical uh, dysplasia was detected here on the right hemisphere along uh, the single edge gyrus on the right. And if we go back and we, we, we have a look at that, uh, <clears throat> we can see, sorry, I, I was wrong in this patient. Um, you can see over here that the patient had a lesion on one hand, additionally over here in the right frontal lobe, the patient had an additional lesion here in the parietal lobe, and the patient had a third lesion over here in the single edge. So um, this patient had three epileptic 
potential epileptic lesions, but the one that was fitting best into the clinical semiology was the one over here at the junction um, of the right temporal parietal area over here. And you can see, and this is the T1 map over here, that this lesion directly touches the cortex. So we thought this could be a very small, subtle um, FCD1 uh, cortical dysplasia here in the parietal lobe. A second and also very interesting way to look at this kind of lesions is looking at the focal demyelination of the white matter. So this was a patient that was suspected um, to have a seizure onset in the left occipital lobe. This is the <clears throat> three Tesla uh, image over here. You can only hardly see that there is some hypomyelination over here in the left occipital lobe. If we then jump to three Tesla, then you nicely can see over here that there's a larger area um, of hypomyelination that is also confirmed here in the, sorry, confirmed here in the flare images, also hardly or not to see in the flare images. And if you then take uh, into account the T1 weighted image, and we go along here, the Myers loop that is projecting into the, into the visual cortex over the C, then you can see here some gray matter cells that are spread uh, into the white matter. And this is a so-called transmental columnar heterotopia, and this one has caused the seizures of the patient. And a third case over here, so this was, I think for me, it was a very impressive one because this was a 16-year-old male with focal epilepsy that was suspected from the frontal insular origin. Once we, once we performed the, the, the ultra-high-field MR, we easily saw that there is a focal cortical uh, displeasure over here. There's a blurring of the gray-white matter zone in the anterior insula. And this was clear, so this is a focal cortical displeasure. And then we looked into the chart of the patient and we realized first that he had previously an FTG pad and you can also see the hypometabolism on the right over here. And this was at that time, this was uh, considered to be normal, but you can see already that there is hypometabolism. And we further looked into the chart and we saw that this boy received 10 three Tesla MRs starting from the age of 10. So, so he went two times every year into a MR scanner in order to detect the lesion. And if he looked back into the first MR where the patient arrived having a seizure, uh, and at that time being still in an periictal hyperperfusion, there was also an ictal swelling in the area that we identified as the seizure onset zone, respectively as the as the structural epileptogenic lesion over here. And once we dated back into the first images, we could already see uh, where the potential origin of this lesion was. So in other words, ultra high field may also, and this is one of the really important, I think indications may help to avoid unnecessary imaging. I would then briefly go into into vascular imaging. And as I said, so, so one of the goals is to, to make patients or to bring patients back to be normal persons. And this is, for example, the case if you're looking for, for incidental findings like unruptured intracranial aneurysms. And we had a first study that has been published today in AGNR. And we looked at 30 patients uh, where 10 only of these 30 patients that have been suspected with three Tesla to have an unruptured intracranial aneurysm had a confirmatory scan, whereas in 18 of the other 20, we could revise the diagnosis. In only 10%, these patients got newly diagnosed with having an unruptured aneurysm, but in the majority, we could say the patients go home. Uh, there are no further controls necessary. And I think this is one of the major beauties of ultra high field imaging. If you can turn a patient back into a normal person. And here you can see two of the examples. So this is, for example, an infundibular branch that was initially suspected as being an, an aneurysm, but it's clear that it's just simply an infundibular branch here on the, on the right side. You can see this is an aneurysm of the acum, so there's no vessel going out of that. And by that, we can really confirm uh, the patient uh, to be safe without having further invasive diagnostics. Of course, uh, inflammation, especially vessel wall inflammation, is a very important point. And 
I think the majority of you, you are uh, familiar with the uh, CAA related inflammation that typically shows these images of a phleptomingial enhancement, but also of this diffuse flare and T2 hyper intense signal changes that look kind of press like. But sometimes it's rather difficult to also diagnose the associated angiitis. So, do the patients really have an active vasculitis or not? And here again, uh, if it comes into play and our approach is to use something that we call a 737 approach. So we bring the patient into the ultra high field unit. We start with the examination. We then switch over to three Tesla, administer contrast there, complete the examinations with sequences that we do not have uh, within the, the ultra high field MR. And then we go back into the ultra high field. You can see this here, but you can see nicely also the enhancement here of the peripheral vessels that indicate the vasculitis and also the meningeal inflammation of this patient. And I would like to close my today's lecture with having a, a look on, on autoimmunity. So, so something that we know and which is, which is especially um, threatening condition in multiple sclerosis is who is at risk uh, of developing a progressive multiple sclerosis. And there are some markers that indicate an increased risk of this progression to secondary progressive multiple sclerosis. And this is the amount uh, of the initial acute inflammation. So it's the number of active lesions. It's the number of the so-called persistent lesions. So, so, so the T2 lesions. So if there is a high T2 lesion load at the very beginning of the disease, these patients have a higher risk in developing a secondary progressive MS. Recently, this has been, <clears throat> this has been added uh, by the notion that uh, these uh, uh, cortical rim lesions also play a very important role. So the ones that, 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 that show the susceptibility on the SWI images around the lesion, the so-called slowly progression lesions, they also bear a higher risk for the patients to develop secondary progressive MS. And of course, there's also, very recently it has also been addressed that the amount of, of meningeal inflammation also is an indicator of the risk of progression. Um, we looked also in our cohort. So for us at the very beginning, we were interested in how frequently can we confirm um, <clears throat> patients or, or patients that really show multiple sclerosis if we add um, additional criteria to the revised McDonald 2017 criteria. So these, these typical features that come along with true multiple sclerosis are the presence of central vein sign. It's also the presence of the iron rim sign. So both the central vein sign and the iron rim sign, they are not frequent, they're very rare. Um, in patients who do not have multiple sclerosis, and the same is true for gray matter lesions. And by adding this criteria, so in half of the patients that we had currently under investigation, and this is an ongoing study, we could perform a confirmatory scan. Um, in uh, three other patients, we could confirm that it is uh, another kind of an autoimmune reaction. In one only of the patients, we needed to de revise the diagnosis, and three of the 13, they just had a, an extensive transverse myelitis with a definitely normal brain. So this is really, I think, very promising technology also for the future in order to see which patients really fulfill the criteria of multiple sclerosis at a very early stage of the diagnosis, especially when they come, for example, with a radiological isolated syndrome. And you can see here from this uh, dot on the left, uh, from this graph on the left, that uh, the, the, the presence of the central vein sign is much more uh, present in patients with multiple sclerosis compared to other um, autoimmune disorders, like, for example, lupus erythematodes or also Bacher disease. And there's also a difference in uh, between uh, the numbers of, of uh, uh, central vein signs in patients with multiple sclerosis compared to aquaparin 4 positive animal spectrum disorders and MOGAT. So also this has been shown while the MOGAT and the anti-aquaparin anti, uh, 4 antibody NMOSD did not 
significantly differ. So it's a marker or it's a, it's a helper to identify the central fan site. Looking at the prognostic markers for the turn into, um, into a chronic MS, so there's the initial lesion load with active lesions, but also with inactive lesions, uh, inactive lesions but there's also uh, the load with the so-called slowly expanding lesions. And the slowly expanding lesions, they uh, are characterized by an accumulation of, of iron-laden microglia and macrophage uh, at the edge, at the rim of these lesions, and they follow usually the resolution of acute inflammation. And there are also markers for potential higher risk of disease progression. And this can be easily detected by ultra high field MR, while it is sometimes rather difficult with three Tesla MR. And several studies have shown also a prognostic yield for the presence of this kind of lesion. So if there are more um, than four paramagnetic rim lesions, this patient showed to have a higher risk of brain atrophy. They also show a higher prevalence into uh, the progression of uh, progressive multiple sclerosis versus the patients that have less than these four lesions. And finally, also these lesions tend to uh, expand over time within at least the early stages of the disease, within the first five to six years. Some drawback is that they are not specific, so these rim lesions, they occur in all of the MS phenotypes, so it's not a classification of a certain subtype. Another advantage of ultra high field MR is the detection of cortical lesions, and this can be done uh, with the MP2 range. The sequence, so the T1 weighted uh, sequence in the ultra high field MR, and it has also been shown uh, that the amount of or the presence of cortical lesions at the very beginning of the disease is predictive for the time uh, for the conversion to secondary progressive MS. And if you identify more than seven lesions in early images, uh, then you have a much higher risk uh, to, to, to convert into progressive MS within a relatively small or a relatively close time period, while uh, the, where the less lesions are apparent on the T1-weighted image, the risk is much lower uh, that you develop uh, progressive MS. By that, I think three of the markers that really can add additional confidence by using ultra high field MR is the presence of cortical lesion, that's the presence of slowly expanding lesions with this uh, classical uh, perilesional rims, and it's the focal meningeal enhancement. And, and in the literature, according to literature, again, the diagnostic yield of seeing this focal meningeal enhancement is boosted by the factor of three once you change from three Tesla to seven Tesla MR. There are some open challenges for the future, of course, because uh, I think the cortical lesion detection, the automated cortical lesion detection, as well as the appropriate analysis of the cortical thickness is still challenging uh, according to distortions that occur in the ultra high field MR. There are some upcoming promising markers, and this is work from our colleague, Dr. Bogner from Vienna, that showed that the increased myelinositol levels at the very beginning of multiple sclerosis are not only associated with the inflammation or with, with the, 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 the activity uh, of the disease. He also showed that this myelinositol increase may appear earlier uh, than the lesions are visible on the T2 weighted images. So this can, in a certain subgroup of the patient, this is an early marker of the appearance of new lesions in multiple sclerosis. And with that, and I think this is one of the other challenges, also the quantification, so that means the T1 and the T2 mapping of the normal appearing white matter shall uh, in the future give us another opportunity in order to investigate which areas of the white matter and also the gray matter um, are under risk uh, to, to develop no lesion, uh, new lesions on one hand, but also on the other hand to measure the rate of remyelination, which is a positive progress, uh, prognostic marker in the early course of the disease. So we may see what the future will bring here, these kind of technologies, they have not been translated at the moment into any clinical 
application, but they seem to be promising for the future. So <clears throat> I think to, to simply uh, sum up, for the brain tumors, I think one of the big advantages and one of the big opportunities is this kind of molecular profiling that we can achieve either by using CES technologies or by using MR spectroscopy, so especially identifying this uh, correlative markers of 2-hydroxyglutarate that are associated with a mutated uh, glioma. They are very helpful ahead of planning not only biopsies, but also to, to get the first pre-surgical information about the dignity of this kind of tumors. Then I think really one of the already in part established methods, that's the, that's the additional diagnostic yield of detecting a new or a potential epileptogenic lesion. So if you are able to turn a patient with a high risk during uh, the workup, the pre-surgical workup, but also during the operation, uh, not to touch the right brain area into informing the neurosurgeon ahead of the implantation, which area is the one at risk and where should he re resect the lesions would bring a strong additional advantage into the epilepsy surgery programs. And we have it integrated into our program already. Then the other way around, I would say turning a patient into a normal person is also very important. And this is something that we can show that, that the diagnostic confidence of detecting small incidental aneurysms and, and instead of bringing the patient into annual controls, which are cost intensive, but also very uh, pressing for the patient is one of the most promising indications for inflammation, so I showed just the case of, of, of CAA, but this can also be translated into other forms of vasculitis. The detection of vessel wall enhancement is a promising indication for the future. And I think for neuroimmunology, the, the, the differential diagnosis, so if a patient has a central vein sign, if he has a cortical rim, then the probability is extremely high that the lesions are those of a multiple sclerosis also, maybe, for example, there is no yaxta cortical lesion at this moment detectable. And for the future, we will see how much we can infer from these biomarkers the potential progression uh, of the patients during the course of their disease. And this is also becoming more important in the last years since new therapies allow to treat the patient at the level when they turn from a, a relapsing, remitting multiple sclerosis into a progressive one. And one should not miss this therapeutic window where these patients can really be treated. And with that, I would like to thank you for your attention. Thank you for listening, and I'm very happy to take your questions. Thanks. Thank you, Dr. Beast. That was an excellent presentation. It was really impressive uh, to see such uh, creative use of ultra high field uh, MRI, the ictal imaging that you showed, the EEG correlation. Uh, also, thank you uh, for the shout out on slide 14 to our own uh, Stefano Casagranda for the beautiful uh, cest images of the uh, wild type and uh, mutation IDH tumors. Uh, that was excellent. Uh, we have a, a little time for question and answers and a whole list of questions coming in. Um, uh, many of them are very practical. Um, I'd like to start with uh, a question uh, that reads, um, uh, can you hear me? I can hear you. Everything's fine. Perfect. Okay. Um, how do you deal with typical high field artifacts uh, such as susceptibility uh, or uh, constructive destructive interference patterns, uh, so-called dielectric, uh, uh, dielectric uh, artifact? Um, do you use a multi-transmit at 7T? No, we, we, we just use, uh, we use the, so we try different approaches. We, we try to, to, to apply the dielectric paths in order to overcome this in part. Uh, well, for our questions, it, it has not shown to be really 
too much helpful. So it, it has not uh, it has not uh, improved the situation. And, and I think for for usage of for, for the clinical patients, we just have the, the the clinically certified coils. Also, therefore, I think we need to to stick or we need to keep this uh, kind of artifacts at the moment as one of the. And this is an important this is an important comment. Uh, one of the drawbacks. So we see these artifacts at the frontal bases. We see these artifacts, especially in the lower parts of the temporal uh, lobe. So I think for, especially if it comes, for example, to fMRI studies, I think the lower parts of the temporal lobe, they are still prone to a lot of these artifacts. And, but for, for the hippocampus itself, and, and this is the most important area under investigation for the clinical questions, for example, uh, we can ignore it, but still they are there and, and we need to, to, to deal with them. That's true. That's a limitation, definitely. So there's um, a, a similar question, uh, a little more broad. Um, can you tell us uh, a little bit about the alterations in sequence structure uh, necessary when using ultra high field uh, MRI um, as compared with a, uh, a more routine uh, 1.5 or 3 Tesla strength? Obviously, uh, T1 is impacted, um, but they'd like to know uh, more routine sequences such as flare or DSC perfusion. Are they the same at high field as they would be at a low field strength? No, so just to be honest, we don't have the DSC perfusion installed, right? So that's something we do not use. It's not uh, working in our setting at the moment. Regarding, <clears throat> I think that the major impact is, is, is the time. So the, the, the acquisition of the sequences are longer. So if you have, a, for example, a T2 high resolution image, we really need to take into account that the sequence takes up to 11 or 12 minutes in a, in a good quality. And also for the flare, I think you have seen that from the images. So the contrast, especially at the gray map, is much lower uh, than the one that you usually expect when we, when we, when we look at the uh, 3T images. So there are some definitely there are some 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 risks or some cost factors, but they mainly uh, are related in the clinical scenario that we use to the uh, distortions at the borders, and they're mainly related to um, some signal drops and some signal inhomogeneities at the periphery. But for the majority of the of the questions that we try to address. Uh, with this technology, we still uh, do not struggle with these limitations. Thank you. Um, the next question uh, concerns uh, uh, the fingerprinting pattern recognition. Um, uh, mm -hmm. You showed us in, in your lecture how uh, the recognition of a 2HG peak uh, can correlate with uh, IDH mutation and perhaps identify patients uh, with a better outcome, obviously a, a strong clinical correlation. Um, can you give us other examples of how pattern recognition or fingerprinting is uh, easier um, uh, or the capabilities increased in high field MRI as opposed to low field MRI for other disease types? I think one of the, so we, we, we did not go uh, stronger into, into the details. So one thing I mentioned, of course, is is uh, assessed imaging. So looking at the, at the concentrations of uh, at the different expressions over there. I think one of the, but we have not systematically studied that. One of the, the options is really to <clears throat> to look, for example, at omic structural omic profiles in epilepsy. So there's also the possibility to use, for example, the segmentation as a readout for further investigations. And one of the, the very simple examples that I do have is that we that we looked systematically at uh, the surface to volume ratio. It's a very simple marker. So you just instead of, of, of calculating the volume of hippocampal atrophy, you combine the volume with the surface ratio. And this turned out to have a much higher um, effect size once you combine these two parameters compared to when you just look at the simple segmentation and take out the volume. So, so this is one of the, of the really simple ones. Other options, of course, is to, to try, but this is something we have never tried, uh, is to look really at omic markers in, in gliomas. We've heard about the, the T2 flare mismatch is a very strong and sensitive marker in order to identify patients that, that, that having a low risk of being a wild type tumor. So those are the ones that are mutated. Usually they show this kind of, of, of mismatch. 
But there I could imagine that it could be also uh, be an option to use uh, the segmented output of these tumors in order to determine other omic profiles. But, but currently I'm not aware of a study that has done this, but I can say that for the simple approach, for example, to looking at surface ratios, this, this works. Thank you. Um, I have a question. Sure. Um, <laughs> I, you made a very convincing argument for the utility of high field uh, MRI in everyday clinical practice, uh, tumor spectroscopy, multiple sclerosis, epilepsy, the, the aneurysm detection that you showed. Um, I, I really enjoyed the, uh, the 3D reconstructions, by the way, of the hippocampal formations uh, the, that, you, that you showed. Um, obviously, these examples would change patient management. Uh, but ultra-high field MRI carries, uh, carries a significant cost, not only the machine, uh, but the increased cost of housing the unit, running the unit, uh, the impact on the workflow. Uh, these are all now critical for, um, for uh, medical practice, for medical imaging. Um, can you tell us how the field of uh, ultra-high field MRI imaging is evolving so that it can be more easily integrated into this everyday practice, into the everyday diagnosis of uh, diseases that the radiologist sees. So <clears throat> let's first touch the, the painful aspects of reimbursement. So there is, no, there is no special, at least in Switzerland where I work, there's no special reimbursement for this kind of technology. And that's one of the reasons why we use it. I've mentioned it as the, as the 737. So, so we do kind of a combination of the two methods in order to, to, uh, to get reimbursed for the three Tesla part of the examination. And we add the other one at the moment at kind of a, of a no compensation model. So, so still we run it in a, in, a, in, a, in a hybrid model for the moment. I think something that is really important that is to convince and that's, that's the, at the moment, that's the stage where we are currently in. We want to provide evidence that having the ultra high field early in the diagnostic workup can help to avoid additional and, and non-confirmatory three Tesla examinations. I showed this re really drastic uh, example of the young uh, of the young boy who received ten images, and these images they were either normal or some speculations about hippocampal sclerosis. And you see this so frequently: the patients are sent two times or three times to the MR with the question, "Do you now see a hippocampal sclerosis?" Because one had initially said it should be one, and then you have three or four or five of these images. Uh, of these, these, these MR examinations and, and there is no final conclusion. And I could imagine that one way to convince also insurers is to say, instead of providing unnecessary numbers of, of examinations, we go directly to that. At the moment, on a practical level, the indications are made by the boards, by the boards of specialists. So we have, for example, a dedicated neurovascular board, we have a dedicated uh, board for, for epilepsy and the indications come from the interdisciplinary teams. So, so it's not one person who sends the patient to the imaging. It's always a, it's a joint decision of the experts when they feel that uh, it is necessary to, to, to try at least everything to, 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 to make a diagnosis or on the other way around to, to make a, or to revise a diagnosis. And this is the way it goes in our center. So it's a board decision. Patients are sent by the specialist boards and the, the examinations are currently done on this 737 basis. So you would make the argument that improved detection, in fact, provides value-based medicine. Definitely. And so trying to avoid unnecessary indications is one of the major impacts for the high field, I think. Excellent. Uh, we have just a minute left. I'd like to squeeze in this last question. Um, someone asks, um, do you see any clinical complications with ultra high field uh, imaging, such as uh, dizziness or vertigo reported by the patients? Uh, and if so, uh, is this frequent and how do you manage it? So definitely the patients complain about vertigo. Almost all of them have this sensation once they enter the scanner and once they are taken out. I think one of the, the principal advantages is that the new system has not a manual table anymore. It has an automated table. This allows to bring the patient very carefully into 
the scanner. And we really, we did not have any dropout uh, related to vertigo up to now, because the patients are really, they're informed about this uh, situation that they may experience dizziness um, and uh, they, they tolerate it very well. So, so we really didn't have any dropouts. We, all of these patients, of course, they had previous MRs at three Tesla. So they are familiar with the environment. It's not a patient who sees the three Tesla, at the, at the seven Tesla at the very first exam. So, so we do not have this kind of claustrophobic dropouts anyway. And the vertigo that, 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 that occurs during entering and, and leaving uh, the scanner, um, that's something that is tolerated well. The most, I think, intriguing thing is that patients uh, complain about the muscle twitches. So this is something that is frequently said by the patients that this is not very, very nice to tolerate. The electrical um, stimulation of the nerves, that's the problem. Well, I want to thank you. Um, we've, we've run out of time. We have uh, no more time for questions. Um, I, I want to thank you uh, for uh, your time, your consideration for that excellent presentation. Uh, I very much uh, enjoyed it. I'm certainly, certainly our audience did as well. Um, and um, we hope to welcome you back at another time. And uh, with that, everyone, thank you for attending. Uh, and that uh, concludes uh, this uh, segment of the OLEA educational series. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for having me and have a nice evening. Bye. You too. Bye-bye.